Okay, well, hello and good morning, good evening, for early evening where I am. Fabrice, it's very early morning for you. Alberto, lunchtime for you, I believe. Um, considering the times we live in and the technical difficulties that some of these events handle, we are missing three of our panelists at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you get the two best one, Vanessa, so you don't have to worry. Oh, for sure. I'm not going to have to do anything. I'll just give you two gentlemen the floor. But um, we're here. We're going to be talking about promoting diversity and spearheading intersectionality. Um, the outline of this panel is the, the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed protection for minorities against workplace discrimination, but their corporate representation is still rather low. What is being done to alleviate this? How to spearhead intersectionality as a way to understand different worldviews? How to work over cultural boundaries? And what advice do HRM departments present? How do firms positively recruit? So that is our team, our panel. We've got Samantha joining us. Samantha, can you hear us? Hi, I can hear you. But I oh, good. Hear. Samantha, we can't see you, though, yet. Okay, let me see what's wrong with the camera, but I'm here. Fantastic. Well, Samantha, welcome. We're still waiting for Anna and for Jaden to join us. But in the meantime, I will introduce the panelists that are here. So we have Alberto Padilla, Senior Director at Insight Partners, based out of the UK. He is the Senior Director and Head of Global Corporate Partnerships at Insight Partners. Insight is a global venture and private equity firm investing in high growth technologies and scale up software companies out of New York. Prior to Insight, he spent six years at Bain and Company and, mon and monitor Deloitte, advising com com companies on business and customer strategy, operating model design, digital and agile transformation and performance improvement. He also serves as co-chair of the board at Eurout, Europe's largest LGBT plus conference for business students and professionals linked to London Business School, which is actually where we met and where our friendship began. He is also a founding board member of Out Investors, a new global network of LGBT plus investment professionals with a mission to make the direct investing industry more welcoming to LGBT plus individuals. And lastly, he is a founding member of Series Q, empowering LGB LGBT plus founders and employees working at startups. We've just lost Suzanne. So now I'm going to go to Fabrice, who is uh, managing director at Out Leadership in the US. So I think the only way I can describe you is as a master of leveraging the power of Out Leadership member companies for social change globally. Oh, I love that. I'm, I might borrow it, you know. I'll, I'll email it to you. I Thank thought there you. was no other way of describing you after Thank reading you. your bio. You. Yeah, he also leads Quorum, an initiative to increase representation of LGBTQ plus people on corporate boards. Fabrice is a member of L'Oreal Global Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Board and a director of Outperform, an impact investing fund. Previously, this I find fascinating, and one day we'll have to chat about this separately, um, Human Rights Officer at the United Nations in New York from 2016 to 2020, where he worked on free and equal, an unprecedented United Nations campaign for LGBTI equi equality, and Senior Country Officer at the World Bank from 2001 to 2016. He sits on many boards supporting the LGBTI rights and has received countless um, uh, awards for the same efforts. We've got Samantha, who hopefully we'll be able to see, but we can hear her. Samantha Carlin is the founder of Empower Global in the U.S., uh, CEO of Empower, that facilitates training on DEI and gender issues for Fortune 500 companies. Empower also runs groundbreaking Women's Leadership Challenge for small Oh. He is a facilitator for Equal Reality, which use, utilizes virtual reality for DEI and for Corn Fairy. Am I saying it correctly, Samantha? Yeah, that's correct. Corn Fairy. She is the host of Samantha, Samantha Politics, a talk show about global politics and women's rights. Previously, Samantha led the global engagement for Silicon Valley tech company 
led Ashoka's programming with women social entrepreneurs, built coalitions for the Hillary for America campaign, and managed the women's issues portfolio for the U.S. Embassy in Sar Sar Sarajevo, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, when the others join us, I can introduce them. And my name is Vanessa Reye. I am your chair. I'm the street chief strategy officer at Buffalo Grid, a um, company that its objective is to connect the unconnected. So we bring digital content to the unconnected. So the bottom of the economic pyramid and refugees and displaced, a former cultural attaché of Mexico in the UK and a regular contributor to Vogue Latin America and fellow board member of You're Out uh, with Alberto, which is a great honor and a pleasure. I also sit on various boards of sustainable fashion initiatives. So in order to start, I think it's important for us to establish three key terms. So the first one would be DEI, very simple, but for those who might be wondering, it's diversity, equality, and inclusion. Another one that is important to mention, and I'm giving literally the dictionary dis 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 description of it, is allyship. So practice of emphasizing social justice, inclusion, and human rights by, me by, by members of an in-group to advise the interests of an oppressed or marginalized outgroup. Allyship is part of an anti-oppression or anti-racist conversation which puts, uh, puts into use social justice theories and ideals. And then I have the other one, which is intersectionality, which is a very interesting term that is now kind of, I think you'll agree, picking up a lot of momentum and people are talking about it. I found two very conflicting descriptions. So the first one is, an analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege. The other one is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to given individual or group, regardless of creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Hi, Jaren. So I wanted to ask the, my three panelists who have been here in Jeden, which one of the two you agree with? Is it completely intersectionality is all about disadvantage or it's about the, you know, the, the advantage and the disadvantage and trying to find meaning in it? So I just want, was curious to know which of the two descriptions you would go for. Alberto. Yeah, no, I mean, for me, it's definitely the latter. And I mean, it's a combination of all of that. And would love to, you know, explore a little bit more around DE&I. It's definitely a term that people are aware of, but what does it actually mean? And, and what's the relationship with intersectionality? So yeah, happy to elaborate a little bit more as well. Fabrice? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, when, when you were reading your description, I was thinking about the fact that, that lately, you know, I do a lot of uh, short clips for corporate boards. And um, and it's so much harder for me to find people of color on women, and and you know meaning that my you know my list tend to be gay white men because gay white men have benefited the most from yeah. progress on LGBT issues, while people of color on women are still lagging behind when it comes to representation. And to me, that's a good example of of how I see intersectionality, which is that if you are part of the LGBT group and you are a woman of color you have a particular disadvantage, meaning that there is an exponential negative impact of belonging to that many minorities. Yes. And Samantha? I mean, I think in terms of intersectionality, I don't really see, it's, it, the, the cool concept is that you have multiple identities that interact with one another. That, mm -hmm. that none of us are just a woman, just a man, just a, you know, just a Canadian. So, like, for me, I'm a Jewish, white woman, you know, in her 30s, who was born in America. So the, the idea is that when we have multiple identities, that they can intersect to advantage us or to disadvantage us. So, for example, a white woman born in America has more of an advantage than um, a woman who is an immigrant from uh, Syria and is a woman of color in America. So that's the mm -hmm. kind of concept of intersectionality. It's these overlapping identities that can create more privilege or less privilege, but it kind of just goes further than saying somebody's a woman or they're a man or they're LGBTQ or they're not. It just goes, I think, to a deeper level to really understand what levels of privilege are multiple identities create or don't create. Okay, great. And Jaden, your sort of take on that? 
Well, actually, I agree uh, uh, completely with what was said. And um, I myself, I'm, uh, you know, born in Turkey. I grew up in eight countries and, you know, uh, I'm Muslim, but my uh, mom is a Jewish uh, uh, descendant. So uh, there are many layers. I'm single. I, I created my own company at the age of 25. So, so when people meet me, they usually don't know which category to put me into. And it becomes difficult for them to... Um, relate to who they're speaking to. So what I have observed throughout the years is that, you know, it's easier for us to just put everyone into boxes, you know, black, white, you know, uh, rich, poor, beautiful, ugly, whatever. It's because we're constantly judging. And because we're constantly judging and making these kind of uh, categorizations, it... I think it's, it was a survival method for humans at, uh, when, you know, back in the day. Um, but we still have it. And that's how we identify and we belong. And we, because we belong, we try to um, survive in our atmosphere through that sense of belonging. So in a way, actually, all of this is a very unique nature of humans, uh, which in my opinion is related to survival, which we don't need anymore. Like what humanity has not understood is we don't need that anymore to survive. We don't need to belong to a certain group in order to thrive. On the contrary, the more diverse we are, the more accepting we are of the differences of others, the yeah. more it adds value to ourselves. So I'm going to interrupt you there and I'm going to bring one of the questions I wanted to ask. And please, you know, jump in, whoever would like to just show of hands so we don't have a bottleneck of voices in the in the stream. But so how does how would how would this concept work in in over cultural boundaries? So you know you're in Turkey, Jeddah, and I believe you're in the U.S. Fabrice is in the U.S. Alberto in London. I'm kind of in in the at the moment in the air. I'm between Portugal, where I'm normally based. But how how do we work over cultural boundaries when we're talking about intersectionality, diversity, and inclusivity? So do they work to our benefit or do they hinder the efforts? from your experiences, actually. And I'm curious to know what Fabrice would have to say about this. Well, you know, I, I think that that, uh, that there, there is some principles that, that, that are common to all humankind, right? And so in, in many ways, um, you know, when I was in the office of the High Commissioner, there is that idea that human rights should always trump mm -hmm. culture. And so sometimes we see culture as being a bottleneck to, uh, to empowering minorities, whether it's women, whether it's ethnic minorities, whether it's, it's LGBTQ people. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot of people that believe that we live in a post-human rights world, but I always saw human rights as kind of this basic set of rules that we have all agreed upon to avoid things like, you know, the, 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 the two world wars or, or constant strife uh, in humankind. And, and so, you know, to me, the way to, to bridge a cultural gap is to continue to reinforce that as, as humanity we can agree on a set of common rules like anti-discrimination. And, uh, and it's difficult because you have a lot of people that, that particularly now will claim that culture and tradition is more important than human rights. And so I think it's very important that we make the effort to reinforce the commitment humankind made in 1947 around a set of common values that, that we can agree upon. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, Fabrice. Actually, and Samantha, I would want to bring that to you because you were at, at the, the U.S. Embassy in Sarajevo, so Bosnia-Herzegovina, and you have a whole history there of oppression, uh, you know, women, the whole, the whole thing, and, and human rights violations, extreme human rights violations. So if, from the perspective of that experience you had there and the work that you're doing now, how would you that link it, you know, over cultural boundaries? What's going on now? Um, so it's a complicated question. You can see me now, correct? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so that's a complicated question. It's kind of loaded. So I want to comment first on with regards to cultural and DEI is that it's not about like helping or hindering, but it is important to understand that the DEI framework really emerged in the human resources community in the United States. And I think one of, these are reflecting, one of the problems with it is that in the United States, I think a lot of people don't consider race 
that where they consider race and gender and not gender. Um, so, wait one second. Um, There. She froze in. Yeah, I we think lost. She lost her, yeah. Okay, so we'll let her come back in. Um, so we've gone back to human resources departments and it being being sort of happening. There you are. Susan, you're, right. back. Um, Samantha, so, you're back. So that's one issue with the DEI in general is that I don't think that there is that a, a good enough appreciation of cross cultural in the u.s that it's not just about overcoming race or gender boundaries that there's that there's a whole body of research on cross-cultural communication and cross-cultural interaction and so what as, as a dei specialist i like the fact that i think that in terms of what i offer is that i have a global background so that i understand cross-cultural interaction um, as part of that and that if you're somebody born in the u.s versus born in india versus born in france there's also different ways of interacting that then interact mm -hmm intersect with being a woman or a man or being black. Um, in terms of Bosnia, I mean, I think Bosnia is the perfect example of if you look at the large scale genocide against the um, Bosniaks, it was because they were Muslim. Um, and, uh, and, and I found Bosnia really interesting. Like this was a really weird thing that I hadn't really understood before that, you know, in the U S if you're born in the U S for the most part, you consider yourself American. And yet in Bosnia, you could be born in Bosnia, but still consider yourself Serb if your parents are from Serbia. Mm -hmm. I know that there's different, you know, that's, that's more common in Europe than in the U S but yeah, you know, so it was just so like, you know, I remember when people asked me after the gen, like after I worked in Bosnia, like, I don't understand. Were like the Serbs killing the Bosnians or were the, and I was like, well, yes, but it was the Serbs from Serbia. And then the people who identified as Serbs because they were Christian had Serb parents also, but they were born in Bosnia, but they call themselves Serbs. And then they were recruited by the Serb Serbs. Um, but it, you know, exactly like those multiple layers of identity. It's like all of a sudden just being Muslim was made. Not enough you know, the victim of a genocide versus being the perpetrator. And this, I've been looking at Rwanda I'm covering Rwanda on my show tomorrow. And like, you know, the same with Rwanda. It's like all of a sudden being Hutu or Tutsi, like everyone's Rwandan, you know, Tutsi, you're slaughtered. Oh, the Hutu, the you're Tutsi. Yeah. And, and, and Samantha, I guess to your point, uh, I think, uh, you know, this, this concept around that double consciousness also comes to play right around, you know, I'm Mexican, but I grew up in Canada, I live in Europe. So what, what do I identify as and through which lens do you see that? And, 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 and to, to, um, uh, Jaren's previous point, um, there's also this tendency for oversimplification, which is obviously going in the opposite direction to intersectionality. Um, so I think when you put all of that together, then you start kind of, the, and that's what I meant by these different layers within diversity, equity, and inclusion. When you start unpeeling it, like, I almost see it as there's like three different rings moving within the same axis, creating all this unique and interesting combinations um, to your point. Well, so, uh, Samantha, we're, you're, uh, Vanessa, you're muted. We can't, we can't hear you, Vanessa. Oh, well, well you, know, you know, in the, in, no, no. We, can't, we can't hear you. That's so strange. But in the meantime, I would say, you know, what I love about what Samantha said um, is the fact that it also shows that paying attention to who is benefiting from from the economic system, paying attention to who is included and who is not included, you know, is also, is also a, a, a necessary condition to stability. And so that's why, to me, DI is not only about cookism or about American, uh, you know, you know, American love to give hugs to each other. It's not only about sentiments. It's actually about ensuring that the system works for everybody so that we have a stable society. Yeah. Uh, because being in a very unfair situation, being excluded, tend to create tension that then lead to conflict. And, uh, and, and so to me, that's also about saving capitalism, right? If the economic system is not working for everybody, what we have seen with Occupy Wall Street, what we have seen with the yellow vest in France, 
is that you have the you have the beginning of incredible tensions mm -hmm. that could lead ultimately to a revolution if we look at history. And so so that's what I love in your comments, Amanda, that it's also about ensuring that society doesn't collapse. No, Vanessa, we miss you though. Um, it might be easier to to restart um, your son. And I think the the other point that that um, I think we wanted to discuss was around this um, concept of allyship and intersectionality, right? And I think you know when I think about you know the social awakening um, that we all had following the death of George Floyd, I think there's there's some people's response was driven by guilt, and and I think guilt is not an effective motivator, and nobody wants to do something that reminds you that you feel guilty about something, and. You know, if I think about um, John John uh, Fraud, the American journalist, and he very eloquently put it um, in one of the events that I heard him speak, where he talks about these false restarts, uh, where we have this three steps forwards and two backwards. So how do you reconcile the social awakening and progress that was initiated by the death of George Floyd, then followed by the taking over of the Capitol a few months later, right? And, and to mm -hmm. the point that was discussed, right? We all have these sources of privilege and disadvantage. And I think it's using our position of strength to empower each other. Um, so I think, you know, I had the benefits of mentors that made me feel comfortable with my sexuality and who I am and my identity. And we also need to help other people in underrepresented minorities to navigate theirs, right? So I think this misconception on allyship, we all need to be allies to those facing discrimination based on any factor considered in, in the whole spectrum of intersectionality. Yeah. I agree, and it's about. I think what 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 is needed to be done is like uh, we need to normalize what's different. So whatever is different, uh, you know, in whatever way, it should be normalized. And the only way I think we can do this is is at an early age, because I think it's also uh, about the way our brains work, because it is neural synapses that have been built over the years, whichever. Uh, part of the world you were born into, whatever religion you were born into. So you have these synapses in your brain that has defined uh, your perception. So the way we perceive things is actually very neurological as well. It's almost biological. So uh, that has to start at an early age. And I feel like nowadays, um, especially, you know, we have a common culture now uh, with Netflix and all of the social media. I think we're building a global common culture. And mm -hmm. there, I feel like, you know, the new generation is going to be very different from the way we grew up because all of those, you know, taboos are being broken in um, in uh, on the new shows that are made or on social media. So I think I'm hopeful of the future in that sense. It's about being human. Mm -hmm. I missed, can you hear me now or no? Yes, we can hear you. Thank God. Okay, so I missed what was happening before. So can I go back to a question I had before my technical uh, little mishap? So I, I wanted to bring in the concept of allyship. I was saying that I learned from Alberto. And because we were there. And so I wanted to bring it in and just say, you know, allyship and intersectionality, that why do we need each other to push the agenda? Um, and I'll just give an example of what happened to me at one of the year out uh, conferences when I was uh, moderating the allyship panel, where I was actually questioned by someone, what was I doing on the panel? I don't know if you remember, Alberto. And I yeah. described myself as, you know, I said, well, I am an, I am an ally of the community but I am a single divorced mother of two. I, I have a tech startup. I work as a cultural attache of Mexico in the UK, so in like macho, macho land. And I'm Latina because I'm Mexican, but I went to school in the US and I was married to a European. It, I was like, am I just maybe possibly a minority with any of those things when I didn't even know that was called intersectionality? So that's why I wanted to talk about, you know, allyship yeah. and intersectionality functionality and how it needs one another. I love this, uh, Vanessa, because, you know, I, I have a girlfriend called Caroline Vagneron at the World Bank, and uh, she was vice president of the Employee Resource Group Globe, you know, for LGBT people. And uh, and then she became president. And people all the time would tell me, they would say, I didn't know Caroline was a lesbian. And I would say, she's not a lesbian, you know. What? She has a boyfriend, and, but she's extremely <laughs> passionate about the of situation of LGBT. We're all people. We're humans. This is why I always well, say and you know, I was, I was on the phone with Caroline a few weeks ago and she said to me, she said, you know, you don't have enough, uh, you don't have enough women in your life. 
And she's right, you know, I do spend a huge amount of time with gay men. And, and to be honest, my network is probably 70%, you know, I don't know, but on LinkedIn, it's probably 70% male, gay male, right? And by opposition to, uh, to lesbian or straight women. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I have to make that intentional um, effort to bring in women in my life. Yeah. Well, you have three new ones here, Fabrice, for your yeah, link. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I have to make that intentional effort on, on the short list yeah. I give for board position to put women on. Because mm -hmm. the truth is I feel more comfortable and I have more trust in gay men. You know what I mean? In, in a way, no, oh, it's, it's true. But, it's, but it, doesn't come, it doesn't come from a place of hate. It comes from a place of fear, right? Of fear of what is different, of what I don't really know. Uh, and, and I, you know, what I, what I, the response I would say to what Alberto said about, about the George Floyd murder is that if there is a point where you have to make that conscious effort of I'm going to intentionally bring difference in my life. I'm going to intentionally open myself to different cultures, to people I'm afraid of. And that's how you bridge the difference. Yeah. And, uh, and to me, you know, now I make an effort at Out Leadership, when we give shortlist of candidates for board position, I want to have a certain number of people of color and I want to have parity in my shortlist. Because if I'm only going to give shortlist of white gay men, I'm basically perpetuating discrimination yeah. while trying to introduce uh, diversity. Of course, of course you are. Anybody ha else have an opinion on this? question. I think it's an important one for our subject. Well, the, I mean, the whole concept is that you, when it comes to allyship and intersectionality, so, so A, I think there is that level of analysis there. Like, I really liked what Fabrice said a while ago about understanding these different things so that you can have equity for all. That you, you have to understand that there are, you know, that that the categories get a lot deeper than just gay, straight, woman, man. Um, and that, 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 you know, a certain religion, for example, may, may disadvantage somebody. Um, so I, I just, I really wanted to reinforce that point that Fabrice made, because I think it was really good. But the whole concept of allyship is basically to use your privilege to help others. And I think it's really Im important to that, that, you know, I, I teach a feminist leadership course now and people still say to me, like the word feminism, like, oh, does that mean you hate men? It's like, no, we love men. We need men. We want men. You know, it's just about creating equity. It's about having equal rights. And for this particular program, just having a safe space for women to talk and reflect and um, yeah. learn new styles of leadership based on feminist principles. But it, it, it you know, like there's, for example, these two white military men who wrote a book called The Good Guys. And they are all over my LinkedIn and they are now on every panel. And frankly, they're smart marketers too because they're like the only two white guys who wrote a book about, you know, being allies to women. And now they're asked to be on every panel. And unfortunately, you know, with the macho male community in the US, sometimes the, you know, male military has more credibility talking about allyship and why, you know, how you should help women than I do. Um, and they're using their privilege to, and their position to influence and persuade on behalf of the more marginalized. And I think that's amazing. That is great. And we're going to go to a question I wanted to give Alberto specifically, which is you're saying they're all over, all over LinkedIn and they're on all the panels and they're great marketers because <laughs> Alberto sort of er, niche or area of one of his many expertise and know-how is in an, increasing di in an increasingly digital economy, how are tech and innovation leaders driving great, uh, greater diversity and inclusion? Sure, yeah, I mean, as I was saying, like I think some of the recent events, and I mean, just earlier this week with the Atlanta shootings, um, I think we, like many other companies, just sat down to understand what's going on around us. And, and we came together as an organization and started a conversation within our own um, Zoom hallways now since it's all digital, but we started addressing some of those topics that were never publicly discussed. And we, first of all, started feeling more comfortable having these conversations, but also being committed to have a more vocal role with our stakeholders. And most importantly, take action and do something about it. So um, we, as, I, as you mentioned, Vanessa, I work at a very large software investor. We're one of the world's largest software investors. 
And we have the ability to influence not only our employees, but also our portfolio companies and the broader tech and investment ecosystem around us. And so we have a very wonderful privileged position to make a bigger difference. So what we did is we developed 21 initiatives that took into consideration these three stakeholders. We made them public. We assigned an executive sponsor to each one of them. We had a scale up pledge uh, with three cornerstones around reporting. And as our managing partner said, if you want to lose weight, you first need to start by weighing yourself and then keeping track of that progress. Um, so reporting is critical and, and having metrics that are clear is important. Then we focus on recruiting and then belonging. So those are some of the, th the three things that I think are super important to make some progress. And when you think about venture capital and private equity firms in their portfolio companies, there's an outsized ability to influence the, the status quo. So I think just to, to complete that, 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 that thought, there's also this notion on inclusive virtue cycles. And if I can draw a parallel with the Silicon Valley, what makes the Silicon Valley unique is the mix of ingredients that they have. You know, they have great education and universities, they have funding and capital, there's large, well-established companies, and this creates a virtuous cycle and ecosystem around this area, and that allows people and companies to break through and emerge. So for underrepresented minorities, though, a lot of these pieces are still missing, and there's segments of the population that are not going to these top schools, there's fewer opportunities, there's lack of role models, and there's part of the population that doesn't have access to these core benefits. So diversity also needs innovation from my perspective. Yeah. And it's on us to create those nodes and ways to build ecosystems and virtual cycles for everyone. This is why I'm very passionate about your out and out investors and really anything that creates this neural network type structures that build community, create an even playing field for everyone, but obviously also harness the power of allyship, which is dri the driver of progress ultimately. Yeah. So, Samantha, so, Jenna, I'm going to come to you after because I'm trying to build a connection here. But, Samantha, um, you use technology, particularly virtual reality, for DEI efforts. So can you tell us just a little bit about how that works? Um, sure. It's really cool. <laughs> I, you know, it's not my company, so it's called Equal Reality. And I stumbled across them when I was advising, um, I was advising an incubator that incubate social good, um, social good entrepreneurs. And I was just advising some of the entrepreneurs there and they were like, yeah, we have this virtual reality where basically you can be in the shoes of another. So you can put uh, a headset on and it's like surround sound. And, you know, if you haven't done VR before, one of the things that's really cool about it is 360. So you can't escape. It's not like a movie where you're watching it and then you can check your phone and then your email pops up and then your husband walks in the door. Um, it's, you know, you turn around and you're still in the scenario. So they were like, do you want to try it? And I was like, sure. So the, the scenario they put me through was of a disabled woman. And I have a multiply handicapped sister um, who's in a wheelchair, can't walk, talk, hold her head up. I mean, she's extremely handicapped. And so I always thought if anybody has like empathy for handicapped people, it's me. I grew up taking care of her. It's just different when you're in the shoes of that person. I, I felt how, you know, in the wheelchair, people look down on me. People talk to me like I was a child, you know, all of those things. And so what's so powerful about virtual reality is I think that what ultimately creates change is an emotional experience. It's not necessarily just knowing where some people are, you know, they're smart enough to take the knowledge and be like, okay, this is why we should have diversity. But for a lot of people, it's the emotional experience. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. I never understood what it felt like to be excluded. So now when I run workshops, um, it's not all the time because it, it depends if the company wants virtual reality and it's more expensive. Um, and they've created a flat screen version now, which I don't like as much as with the headset, but just because of COVID, but it's still cool. Uh, it, but it really, using that as the initial thing, it kind of, like I do DEI trainings for Corn Ferry and for lots of companies without virtual reality. And it's just like, yeah. it takes forever to like get into it and be like, okay, yeah. here's the case. Here's what's going on. Like giving people virtual reality is like a shortcut. Like they go through the VR experience for eight minutes and they're just like, they like, they woke up and they're like, okay, what do I do? How can I help? Because we've got, I mean, I know some of Jaden's personal stories with her professional career, you know, having gone from media to, brokering deals between uh, you know some of the largest companies in, from turkey with governments in angola and all of these things so i think she has sort of the real life experience of what some of your virtual reality um 
uh, programs do. So I just, because we've got little time left, I just wanted to see how, how have you used intersectionality in your career, Jeren, uh, briefly? And, you know, sometimes it's hindered. I know you very well. You're an incredibly bright woman and you manage your way through these labyrinths of like limitations and oppositions and things like that. But I just think it's a very interesting way, the way that you've managed. Of course, the daughter of a diplomat would. But just if you can tell us a little bit about those experiences. And then I've got a question that feeds into Fabrice and I'd love to get that in before we end. I'll be very quick. Thank you, Vanessa. And um, I think the key word here is empathy for me. Uh, what, uh, what, what actually makes you um, relate to people and what makes other people relate to you is empathy. So if you're able to play around with that, because that's exactly what virtual reality is doing as well, it puts you in the shoes of another, so you can empathize with that person, how that person feels. So it, it, I think that is the key word at every level, even business or, you know, uh, you know, social atmospheres, um, any sort of discrimination. When you're in the shoes of another person, like when I'm working in Africa and I was 25 when I went to Angola and I was, I saw uh, that this was a country that had 30 years of civil war and it was devastating. Uh, brothers were killing brothers. And when I was there and I could feel what they went through, that's when I made the change and I brought CNN International and said, look, stop uh, looking at Africa as a place to do safaris. We have to talk investment, we have to talk culture, we have to talk about uh, human rights, many things. We stop looking at it from one perspective. And yeah. they listened, they followed through. And it was a success. So I think my the gist of it for me is empathy. Work on that. Yeah. And then, you know, empathy is the human connection or at the most human level. But Fabrice, there is a lot going on with legislation and with, you know, some of the, the Fortune 500, 100 companies. And I believe uh, I'm going to read it here. But recent developments in the U.S., AB 979, the Nasdaq proposal, the IPO announcement by Goldman Sachs have placed sexual orientation and gender identity on the map when it comes to underrepresentation. King, I'm very curious. So could you please explain that to us? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you uh, uh, briefly, you know, power never concedes power uh, without a bit of a nudge. And so uh, I really believe that, you know, I love everything that we, 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 we talked about, which is the individual the individual journey to become more inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. I also think that sometimes the legislation of women on corporate board to France, you will see a gigantic gap of about, about 30 points. And the reason is because the legislator stepped in and said, you know, you have to... Uh... So in the United States are a little bit allergic to quotas, as you, as you know. Uh, but, but, but the legislator has stepped in um, through, through many ways, particularly in California, to say you have to have at least one woman on your board. You have to have at least one diverse person on your board. And, uh, and then, you know, we have, we have also economic agents like Goldman Sachs that made a gigantic announcement saying we will not take to IPO any company that doesn't have diverse board members. And I think this is, you know, there is those two tracks, right? On one track, we have, we have to make the case for inclusion and how it benefits all. But on the other track, the legislator has to stop stepping uh, uh, from time to time to see progress. Amazing. Thank you. So I'm just looking um, to see if we've got any questions here. Uh, changing. Um, men are still gatekeepers in so many areas. We need to open the gates, but as allies, not as self-proclaimed heroes. I'm just going to read some of the comments. Um, so Wade said, love your weight, uh, weight analogy, Alberto. Uh, the, and I guess Alberto answered. Um, sounds like an incredible tool. Thank you for sharing. I'm assuming this is the virtual reality. Um, thanking us for the insights and perspectives in here. Changing the approach to Africa has been so important. So, Jeren, that is from the audience to you. And if you all maybe have a, one minute to give your, your, your giveaway of, of what this means to you. And also, I would say not just your giveaway, but a little advice or hope how we can all take a bit of this panel away with us and push the cause further. 
So please, um, Alberto, I'll do it in alphabetical order. Sounds good. Well, I mean, first of all, I really enjoy this conversation. And, 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 and actually, maybe I just want to share a, a quick anecdote. But I think to Fabrice's point around intentionality,